uh, first of all uh, thank you all to uh, for, for re- responding in a very short notice uh, to come to this meeting uh, my special thank to stefan for agreeing to uh, lead the discussion uh, this is a conversation a reflection that we will start today it is only a starting point we need to continue to have this not only conversation but action action to show that we care about black lives and we recognize the immense suffering and hurt that they are feeling and we pledge to take action in future uh, as we go along to make it possible for them to pursue academic careers without fear without persecution without prejudice that's the goal uh we have a long way to go we have a lot to learn on the uh, along the path we are bound to make mistakes but we should not be afraid to accept those mistakes and to learn from them and there are many resources available today uh, for us to learn and today is meant to be the day we start this by going to many different uh, you know links talks videos to to begin to learn about what is really over to you uh with that introduction uh, it's only a small step i would like to um ask uh, abhay to introduce um uh, stefan and then we will get going thank you okay thank you so we're very fortunate today to have with us uh, stefan to guide us through this discussion to um Stefan is a theoretical physicist because not everybody here is from IGC so let me just introduce Stefan a little bit um Stefan is a theoretical physicist who specializes in particle physics cosmology and quantum gravity but he's also a musician uh, particularly a jazz saxophonist and also an author who has really uh, written in particular about the physics of jazz and he really is this multiple talents he holds a masters in physics um, and another one in electrical engineering from brown and also a phd in physics and then after his phd he went to imperial college and and slack and stanford for postdocs and then joined us at penn state faculty in 2005 and he has been a valuable member of igc um for personal reasons of about 3 years after he joined us he felt that at this stage in his life and career he preferred to be in a larger city and so he went back to his alma mater where he had done his undergraduate haverford college near philadelphia in 2008 and since then he has been on the faculty of dartmouth and now a professor of physics at brown and he's also serves on the editorial board of the new and rising journal uh, called universe now so now it's just for us just to he is really stefan is really one of us and i just want to tell you why uh, uh stefan's most well known paper um, is on chern simons modified gravity and that was written when stefan as well as um, nick uh, nico yunis were both here at penn state and at igc and even after he left penn state for a number of years he continued to be on the igc faculty and his research continued to be closely related to the themes uh, that are pursued at igc particularly on the issue of parity violation in the early universe and in fact his academic and personal ties with us uh, continue um, even today and as i mentioned already stefan is an accomplished jazz musician and in fact he has played a saxophone uh, after, after a banquet at one of the conferences in igc and his book i already mentioned the physics of jazz has been extremely well received it discusses the relation between jazz and also cosmological structures he is also f- featured in a nova documentary where he discusses his dual life as a physicist and a jazz saxophonist he was also one of the very few of the out of 10 explorers in the general sense of, uh, of our national geographic it's a very high honor and in that connection he also set, helped us set ties with national geographic and the chief financial officer of national geographic visited us and gave us because of stefan and gave us a um, um <clears throat> a, a, a national geographic flag so this all thanks to stefan 
Now, Stefan is current, the current president of the National Association for Black and Hispanic Physicists, NABHP. He has been a powerful advocate of underrepresented groups in science. And in 2013, he wrote an article in the New York Times addressing issues that are faced, faced by black uh, uh, academics. Mm -hmm. And in that article, he drew on a number of personal experiences uh, from his own education and life. So I'm really very happy that Stefan agreed to join us today because it's true that there's a lot of material now on the web and so on. I myself, I've been following it, reading it, and I'm really learning a lot. But I think there is no substitute for hearing from somebody like Stefan, who has his own personal experiences and who may have very valuable advice for us. And we know that he has a rather busy day, and so he may have to leave the meeting at some stage. So I just want to tell you that in advance. And we're looking forward to hearing, Stefan, your views and, you, and uh, how you lead the discussion uh, that you're kindly agreed to do today. Okay, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, over to you. Uh, we can't hear you, I think you're muted. Oh yeah, I'm muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, um, my brother was asking me to sign a copy of my book for one of his friends. Oh. <laughs> I give a talk right here. I mean, um, or give, I give a, give a conversation. Um, look, this is very easy for me. This is extremely easy for me because, you know, when we think of kind of what, you know, what sort of the, the maelstrom of, uh, and opportunities. So there's a positive side to this. And of course, a concerning side to this. Um, you know, we have the, we've been all been, you know, we've, we've all been dealing with the, with the issue of the pandemic. Um, people are like, you know, have been stationed at home and dealing with that, or, you know, those, those um, issues, those anxieties. And then, you know, then we have the string of all the other things going on. And of course, I, you know, I think it's important that we all, first of all, realize that for all, for different reasons, for all our own reasons, right, we're all in this together. Right? That's the first kind of the place I'm coming from in this conversation. Um, but I, I think I just want to open up by first thanking you all for, um, for, for engaging with me. Um, and to be honest, like, you know, I, this is the first thing I tell people. First, you can, you can actually go check behind the scenes, right? I tell colleagues, I, I've said this when I was at Dartmouth, I've said this at, at Brown, that my best job, the place where my best job, where I was happiest in terms of my work life was Penn State. I've said it consistently. And I kind of want to, so we first, so I think one of the things that can be useful is to actually talk about the good practices that in particular, when we think about cleaning house, our, our where, where the places where we have our agency, we can't try to change the entire universe. But I think, well, unless you are, you know, you believe in this um, Wheeler effect where you observe the universe and whatever, but, <laughs> but I guess my point is that you know, when we think about like really action items and things like that, we got to think about cleaning house first, right? About, you know, and that's kind of where I'm coming from. So the first thing I want to do is actually talk about from my experience, because I, I, that's what I, I can speak most, um, you know, directly from. Um, and honestly, from the things that were great about Penn State um, and that you should continue to do more of and the things that, that did work. So I want to say a few things about that. And I, I, I would probably spend like five minutes saying that. Um, so I just want to give you guys some context. So when I was a um, postdoc at Stan Stanford, it was my second postdoc. Um, I had a very difficult time getting a faculty job. And I remember going to Michael Peskin and saying, who was my advisor? And I said, Michael, I don't get it. Like I published 13 papers and like, you know, and five of them or six maybe were all single authors and they were all published and they had a PRL of Michael. So I was like, what's going on? And you know, and that was that. But the point was that I was struggling to get a job and the only place that offered me a job, um, and I just want to make it clear, Abai uh, recruited me to Penn State. And to me, that is an action item. That is something, if when we think about it, like we don't even have to start talking about this and this kind of issue. It's like, hire me. If you care, hire me and take me seriously. Now, I remember um, sort of, um, you know, coming in as a young junior faculty, very rough behind the ears, very rough behind the ears. I still feel rough behind the ears. 
I actually, I'm writing my second book and I want to, instead of just because, you know, people make things up and they say things in the women of the moment to, to appease an audience. I've been working on my second book um, and I want to, if, if the um, host can uh, allow me to share a screen, because I want to read a paragraph from this up and coming new book. Okay. Yes, please do. Uh, please do. It's about, it's about an experience at Penn State. Uh, so let me share the screen and make sure um, no onerous thing shows up on my, on my screen when I share it. So um, let me just get it. <laughs> let me um, find this and, um, and let me pull this up, screen share. I think you guys will, this will make sense once I share it. All right. So can, can you all see this? Yes, we can. Yeah. Are you seeing yeah. like most of the text? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. I okay. uh, just want to make sure. So um, I just want to, to page what, one of two. No, that can't be one of two. Hold on a second. All right, it's not behaving itself. But um, the title of my book is called Fear of a Black Universe. And the subtitle is uh, The Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. It, it's meant to be coy and fun, fireside chat of like, you know, my speculations, speculations about the field that Abai and I and others um, here at IGC in, embark on. And it's, so it kind of talks, it tells stories and, you know, I, some of my own crazy ideas. Um, and I wanted to kind of read this chapter, not the chapter, three paragraphs from this chapter. And this chapter is entitled, A Co Cosmologist's View of Quantum Gravity. Um, and I first want to, um, for all the loop quantum gravity aficionados out there, I do want to read one thing for y'all on this one. Um, I say, uh, yeah. There are also pragmatic scientific reasons to seek a quantum theory of gravity. Normally, Abai, this is Abai's, um, you know, that, that's, that's his role in the community. He writes these types of things, but now I'm saying it, okay? Um, currently, there are a handful of unsolved issues at the interface of quantum field theory and classical gravity. And many of, the prob many of these problems find a home in the beginning and early evolution of the universe, where both gravitational and quantum physics are expected to be active. The nature of these daunting cosmological problems, such as the origin of matter over antimatter, inflationary versus cyclic universes, dark matter and dark energy, compelled me to carry out research in both superstring theory and loop quantum gravity. My collaborators and I have spent the last two decades using these cosmic conundrums as a compass to test and further develop these theories. Both loop quantum gravity and string theory have their own communities and their strong feelings about the veracity of each approach. I, I kind of kind of say that um, because, you know, I think that's when we think about kind of what we do in a day in day out basis as physicists, we do get sort of like, you know, we get married to what we do. We get, you know, a little bit attached to it. Um, if you are one of the founders of the field, then you get <laughs> You know, it becomes a child and, you know, you have to um, protect your child. Um, I, that's one thing I kind of wanted to share. Let me say another thing. And this is the one that matters. This is about my, something about Penn State. So Abai will remember this um, um, very interestingly. And I, I want to share this actually for the others, um, the other researchers who, um, who might think they know something about Abai. Um, so... This has to do with a, a crazy idea that I, I thought to pursue when I was a junior faculty at Penn State and kind of Abai's role as sort of um, the director and a mentor. Um, <clears throat> so, um, parity is a symmetry transformation that is analogous to looking in a mirror. When you look at your left hand in the mirror, it is, is, it, it is identical, but gets converted to a right hand. So parity is a transformation in the mirror, da 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 da. All right. Um, all the forces were thought to be invariant under parity transformations. In other words, if we look at a scattering of a left-handed quark with a left spinning gluon field, it would occur at the same probability as a right-handed quark, right? The big surprise was that the weak interaction allowed interactions of one-handedness. While it seems that the violation of parity is inconsequential, life would not exist without it. Okay, then I go on to talk a little bit more about that. And I say, however, the parity violation was assumed in, the, in, in particle physics, and there was no deep reason as to why and how parity violation emerged from some deeper theory. My supposition, my supposition from the resemblance of the Ashtakar connection of general relativity was that parity violation in the weak interaction 
came from quantum gravity itself. Kind of crazy. So what does one do when an idea appears that seems crazy and too speculative? Remember, guys I'm, and, and your ladies, I was coming from a place where I couldn't get a faculty job. And I'm, with one, I'm in a group with, that's known to be the top gravity group in the real world. And, you know, our director who's known to be a, a pretty, you know, whatever. So I said, well, at the time, my strategy was to go to the source, Abai Ashtakar, the inventor of the Ashtakar variable. Abai, there's a, there's a footnote there, by the way. Abai has a reputation for being an extremely technical and detail-oriented, combined with laser-sharp intuition of a theoretical physicist. So if you have an idea and take it to Abai, expect to walk out with your idea in a coffin to be buried in mathematical soil. I knew of young physicists that would be very careful to make sure to iron out any technical details before talking with the master. But for some reason, Abai always gave me a hall pass. He treated me as if I had something to say, even though my ideas were often raw and inchoate. So I felt comfortable telling him the idea. After a few minutes, Abai told me that he, did, that he didn't notice this connection between parity violation and gravity and the weak force and encouraged and challenged me. He didn't give me an easy time, by the way, to pursue the idea. After months of calculation and thought experiment, I developed a theoretical model to explain the weak interaction of parity violation as a gravitational phenomenon. Now, the idea was published. I think the idea is wrong, but that's not my point. Before I go on, I would like somebody to chime in and maybe say why it's worth telling that story and what, what is, when we think about, you know, these big words like social justice and anti-racism and all these things, why you think that, um, from my perspective maybe, this was very life-changing and career-changing and why it, was, why it may seem to be very obvious to many people, but for me, this was a very major moment in my career. Question, let's open it up to, by the way, there's no wrong answers, right? Um, I just want to kind of engage with that question. So did you feel that uh, you had not only encouragement, but engagement in what you were doing and the conversation going? Is that, was that important? Okay, so I'll, we'll just, I'm not going to say yeah and a. I I mean. Um, yeah, let's see I'll, other people, what kind of other there. people here. And then yeah. I'll just have an integrated kind of response. Sure. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Nitin, you are muted. Yeah, I think it's just the question of being taken seriously. It's as simple as that, right? That someone took your ideas seriously, and um, and and it's 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 as simple as that. I think. Um, I okay, think I Julia think... had something in the chat window. Oh, there's something in the chat window. Okay, good chat window. Julia. Yeah, someone says your idea was treated with complete respect. Yeah, that was Kristen. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm oh, not Kristen, looking sorry. at it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Anybody okay, else? good. I think there's an element of like a personal connection and mentoring, certainly there, in addition to being treated with respect, you're also engaging with someone you really respect as well. Very good. All right, let's stop at that. I think I have enough data. Um, so yeah, I, the elements of what everyone said resonated with me. So let me, um, yeah, so let me now give some context. So when I was at Imperial um, College, um, I sort of like, I was spoiled because I was out in, in, in Europe and they didn't really have an affirmative action. They didn't have an affirmative action program. So I was told from day one when I got there by the chair of the group, which was Chris Isham. Chris, I, so many of you know Chris Isham. Chris said to me, listen, I just want to let you know, we don't have, in a British accent, we don't have this affirmative. You know, we took the best, okay? We took three of the best people. And so we expect the best from you, right? So you got to do something here, okay? And to me, I was like, all right, I'm like on a basketball team. They're expecting me to score some points here. And that was very, um, um, that, um, validating to me as a young scientist, even though I'm rough behind the ears. We all are, right? So, but I, I was, the expectation was there. 
And so when I, and I did something good there, I did like one of the first papers on string theory and inflation, 2001. So when Stanford hired me, I was ready to go. I was ready, but then something interesting happened. Many of the postdocs expressed to another friend of mine who was also white and he, but he was a good friend that, you know, they felt that I got into, uh, that I didn't deserve to be there um, at Stanford with them because they were the best. And, you know, there was this idea that, you know, they had worked really hard and I'd gotten in um, with le lesser standards with affirmative action. And they were not really able to let go of that through my three years, even though I was publishing and doing stuff, or maybe I had a different style of doing physics. And I think that, you know, when I became a faculty member, here is somebody from, again, this is all my perspective, somebody who I, um, let's say, I mean, I buy, I mean, I, I, I used to read Ashtakar papers when I was a, you know, when I was a student and, a, and whatever. So he was one of my heroes in physics. Um, and somebody so who there was a validation there and he even though yeah so he did give me i think my sense with abai was he he kind of respected and even admired my way of thinking about physics right um you know he probably knows i'm very intuitive and i think he really did he really did um respect that for sure he showed me that by engaging with me but he also in taking me seriously he also challenged me and he also like would give me some hard knocks advice, things that at times I didn't want to hear, but it was always coming from a place of, you know, you're good, you're fine. You, you know, you are, you, you know, you have promise and I abide and our group, we're here to support you in being your best self and being the best physicist that you can be because you're a part of our team. And so that story kind of was like really, um, one of the many examples, and you know, listen, we all know abide ain't perfect, okay? <laughs> A buy is a buy, right? But I think, and, and, and that, but that's part of it. Like, you know, he was just his genuine self, you know, he, um, and I think that, the, and, he, and, he, and he also, behind the scenes, I know that a buy really rooted for me. Um, he, um, he, um, he played a big, the role in, in recruiting me to Penn State. Um, and I do know that. And it has, the important thing there, it, it, it also provided some best practices for how I, I am to engage students, like not you know, only black students, but women students as well. Um, and I, I find that they respond to that. And going back to what Natin said, it was a simple act and, um, of him taking me seriously. And in that taken seriously, it's like, yeah, I have high expectations of you as well. So please go back and do that calculation. Um, yeah, so anyway, so I just wanted to kind of like, kind of, open up with that story. Um, so I'm gonna pause maybe for some, any kind of comments. Um, this is not a, a one-way thing, this is a two-way thing. Um, so I'm also looking for your ideas and your thoughts um, as we're having this conversation. Um, and as I said, this is, a very, this is a very, you know, if it was Stanford saying, come talk to us about this, I would be like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of, this is uncomfortable, but this is, this is home for me, right? This is a supportive environment relative to a lot of other places. Um, and I, I hope it hasn't changed. I'm just saying from, from where, I, where I come from in my career. Yeah, I, yeah. I absolutely. Take uh, other people's questions. If people can raise their hand, and I can call in turn. Yeah. Uh, Nitin, um, uh, if you don't mind, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Without raising my hand, can I, can I speak? Uh, sure. I can raise yeah, go my ahead. hand. Yeah, yeah, go, okay. go, go ahead. Yeah. It's, uh, thank you. It's uh, wonderful hearing you again. We all agree that uh, the positive thing we have, one of the many positive things we have in Penn State is a buy. Uh, but I remember in our conversations when you were here, and I yeah. remember them very well, uh, most of uh, the negative things that uh, we found in, yeah. uh, in this area of the world were not at Penn State, but in our little town. And um, situations we found produced by different uh, actors in our little town. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and that is, uh, can be too small and too parochial and too uh, for diversities. Yes. Uh, so I was, I, I, and because I remember many of our conversations and I tend to repeat them like a good old, old guy who repeats stories and at some point he doesn't remember if the stories were true or not. Um, I want to get 
back from the source, your impression of our little town as a minority? Yes. If you have so, them present. Yeah, no, so there's definitely- you know, I, mention it. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, like one of the things that I would say um, during my time at Penn State, um, the one thing that, go, the one good thing, and then I'll talk about how that connects to the other elements, was that a number of my colleagues were actually my friends. So I'm talking about the junior um, people, including Jorge. Um, thanks for the Argentinian steaks and all that stuff and, you know, the good beer and, you know, the companion, the friendships with you, you and your family. And so we had, so we had to rely on each other for friendship. And that's, and I hope, you know, because, you know, geographically where things are situated, I think we rely on each other for that, those friendships. That is something I don't have at Brown. I have like two friends on the faculty period, right? You know, um, so, so that's definitely something I, I, I miss. And it was necessary and important to have that support network. Yeah, I mean, look, let's face it. I mean, I, I would get pulled over um, quite a bit. Um, but my, I, you know, you remember me, I had the, the dreadlocks and, but the thing that was interesting about that, it wasn't just the dreadlocks, right? You all knew that I like to drive my very fast Audi. Um, like, um, and I used to, you know, I had the dreads, but I used to wear nice suits. So I think oftentimes the uh, law enforcement thought I was a big fish. Like, <laughs> they thought I was like, you know, one time I was followed actually for like two hours when I was driving from State College to New York and like five state troopers pulled me over and they thought I was the drug lord that was leading the ring between um, central Pennsylvania and New York City. And I had to navigate myself through that. Um, so yeah, so that, that, those, those elements um, persisted. I would say the frequency of that happened more in State College then, but it certainly didn't stop happening throughout my, um, throughout my, um, my, my life. And you know, a big part of that with my young nephews, for example, um, that as an uncle that I tried to, it's like, we can't like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm kind of pragmatic. I, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. Part of it is to also learn how to navigate that, right? And I've, I've had to learn how to navigate that. That's how, that's why I say that. Yes, I, I, did, I definitely did do that. Um, I, was, I was pulled over. Um, but, and one of the things I've done, I've mitigated is like, for example, when I go out, I take an Uber. Um, I have stopped, you know, one, one of my problems and struggles has, has been, was actually back then my drinking. Um, the loneliness of being there, I just found myself in, in, in um, I don't know, the zinc, all these places, um, Zeno's, drinking beer, all, you know, whatever, you know, it was part of what I did. And I, you know, would set myself up in the situations. So part of it, it's a two-way street, I, the way I look at it. So I, I no longer drive, when I go out, I no longer even like drive my car at all. So that I'm never in a situation where I had a drink and I have to drive back home. So I've mitigated certain things. It, it's not foolproof. I certainly don't find myself in like, you know, in wealthy neighborhoods alone walking down the street. And if pulled over by police, you know, it's sort of like there is a modus operandi I'm engaged in. My uncle is a sergeant major in the Marine Corps. He's um, friends with Colin Powell. He's, you know, they rank the sergeant majors. Um, they have a higher rank as, as high as generals. They're 250, about 250. He's ranked number three. He was ranked number three. And my uncle is recently retired. He's in San Diego. And even my uncle tells me, he goes, when I go out, I bring my driver's license and I bring my retired Marine like ID because he can also be mistaken um, for someone as well. Um, I have a friend, Subod, he's Indian actually. He's a um, cosmologist and Subod has a big beard. Like he has this big beard now. And like, he was like, yeah, I'm thinking whether I should cut my beard or not because you know, I, I've been mistaken for being a terrorist or what have you, right? So these profiling things, right? Um, we have to recognize that it's sort of systemic. And I guess part of what's going on here in this nationwide conversation is how to change those things systemically. Um, um, so Jorge, just, I, I kind of went around a circle. Those things did exist. It did fuel, you know, why I moved to Philadelphia. I was, as I said, I was very happy with my job at Penn State. It was truly not, I left Penn State, not for that reason. I was very happy. It was a step down intellectually um, to do that. I took a risk, but definitely, you know, let's face it, um, you know, Philadelphia is Philadelphia, um, right? Um, so that's um, my take. My question to you all is um, what, are, what are the things going on at Penn State to sort of 
help in, in, in terms of lifestyle and supporting um, just faculty, um, um, especially faculty from underrepresented groups, um, young faculty especially, and all faculty, and students and staff um, in, that, in that realm. I'm, I'd like to hear, have things changed since I left? Yeah. Well, Stefan, I think uh, the, the reality of all, of all this is, is that we clearly recognize the egregious examples of things that you, you know, that, that, that you have lived through all your life. But I think, the, I think the thing that we all need to seriously start thinking about is how does this play out in our own immediate spheres, in a classroom, for example. So you talked about you know, the, the stereotypical bias that a cop has when they're looking at someone driving a nice car and who is not white skinned, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what about when we are in front of a classroom and we have 20 students in front of us what stereotypical things go through your own mind as a teacher when you look at that class? I think we honestly have to ask ourselves the question, what presumptions do you make when you simply look at the class and are you making judgments, presumptive judgments based on your own biases? Um, I certainly can't say that I haven't done that in the past myself, right? Looking at an, looking at an Asian student and making the assumption um, that an Asian student is going to be automatically good at something, looking at another student and making perhaps the presumption somewhere in the back of my mind, even though I regard myself um, as someone who's not racially biased, I think we all have to recognize that we all have some intrinsic stereotypes and biases in our mind that we need to fight against all the time. Um, and I think one of the important things we need to realize is that, yeah, we are not cops, who are profiling people, but we in academia are doing this all the time. We do it in our search committees. We do it on the graduate admissions committee. For example, why is it that a graduate admissions committee cannot look at an application that does not have a GRE physics score and say that they, you know, they don't have enough information to make a reliable judgment about whether to admit a student or not? Um, what is it that prevents us uh, you know, from making the kind of decisions that would allow us to bring in more faculty of color, bring in more graduate students of color, right? What is it that's preventing us? I think there are simple actions that we can actually take, um, but we have to take ownership of this. It's up to us you know, as academics and scholars and so on to make these decisions. We make those choices. And, um, and I think this, this is certainly a time that has brought to the fore the you know, kinds of decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, we are certainly not doing the terrible things that cops do, but I think we propagate this in our own ways. And until we stop doing that, things are not going to change. And I think that's why we have to have these, not just conversations, but, um, but take actions, you know, that, that will make an impact. Um, so anyway, I, you know, they're uncomfortable conversations to have because there is a long history of white supremacy in this country. I mean, in different countries, look, in India, we have thousand years of a terrible system known as the caste system. It's horrible, right? It's suppressed, oppressed people for thousands of years. It's uncomfortable saying some of these things. It's uncomfortable saying that as you walk down the corridor in Osman building, and by the way, that has changed, it started to change, Stefan, as mm -hmm. you walk down that corridor and you say that we are recognizing excellence by putting up pictures of Nobel Prize winners. And these are all our heroes, you know, <laughs> they're why we are physicists, right? They change the world and, and they ought to be revered and honored and, and put on the wall. But if that's all you do, then imagine the, you know, the, the young black student who's walking down that corridor or the young female student who's walking down that corridor. Um, what the impact does that have on them? And, you know, we've started changing that. These are little things that we are doing. Um, they're very, very, you know, small steps, right? But, but we have to start doing these things. Otherwise, it's not going to change. Um, so sorry for the speech, but these are things that have welled up in my mind over the last, um, they've been welling up for many years. <laughs> but um, I think what's happening in the last, um, uh, you know, a few weeks has certainly ignited something. So, and I hope it ignites something in all of us, 
and um, we take the steps that are necessary to make a real serious change. Um, thank you. Stefan, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, Stefan, I imagine you'll want to respond to that, but I, I have a response to you as well, Mitten. Um, yeah. a, 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 a tool to share with, with the group when there's time. Uh, I guess I'll share it now then. It's, um, you're asking what small things we can do. And my favorite tool is called amplification. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you can see examples of it. Uh, the women in Congress use this very consciously to support each other. If somebody in a group discussion, like whether it's a student in a study group or professors in a faculty meeting, if somebody is um, being interrupted or talked over or their ideas are being repeated by other people and taken more seriously um, just to echo what that person said and properly credit them with the idea um, or draw attention to the fact that they're trying to speak saying oh i'd really like to hear what so and so has to say that's a great way to uplift um, particularly underrepresented voices um, I try to, to teach my students to do that too uh, with a little presentation at the beginning of the year. Um, kind of like we, we saw an ex a small example here how Julia um, gave Kristen credit for her contribution to the conversation earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I completely resonate with that, by the way. It's something that I've discovered through trial and error um, has great benefits and, and, and being a recipient of it and we, you know, seeing that happen to me personally. I'll give you a, a good example of that. When I was feeling very um, isolated and not, you know, not part of the group at Stanford when I was there. By the way, I'm very grateful, by the way. I'm very, while I say this, I'm very grateful. And, and Michael Peskin will, has been a tremendous, still remains a tremendous um, um, al um, ally friend and um, collaborator. Well, not the collaborator. I've been writing the paper with him for quite a while. But anyway, my point in saying that is that I remember one time I was, um, and um, I heard Michael Peskin arguing with somebody in his office. My office was next to his. And, and apparently it was a faculty person uh, whose name I won't mention, but it was a faculty person. And I, cause I, you know, he was next door to me. So I sometimes can hear the, his high pitched voice where I could hear it. And I remember one time, um, because at the time nobody else was talking to me because they felt like I wasn't really worthy in being in the group. Um, and this is to kind of, I think, amplify what counts uh, as an example of what she says. And I, I, I just remember I used to be sneaking around, you know, trying to be visible. And I, I went into my office and I hear, I hear Michael going, I, you know, listen, you know, um, he's saying to this colleague, um, he was ahead of the group at the time, by the way. He goes, listen, it was, um, you know, we're working on a thing. This was all Stefan's idea, okay? This was all Stefan's idea, you know, and I've just been talking with him about it and it's, it's going somewhere really interesting. I won't mention the name of the other person. That person is a very famous string theorist, right? But the point was that amplification also like, kind of like validated me. I, I, this was, by the way, behind closed doors. I just overheard him saying that. That was our PRL paper that turned out to be um, you know, uh, the, the first inflationary leptogenesis mechanism that you know, appears to make certain predictions about BMO polarizations. But my point here is that going back, I remember saying to myself, wow, I like, you know, okay, maybe I belong here a little bit, you know? Um, and it was enough fuel for me to just continue going on and just believing in whatever I was doing. Um, so I totally um, resonate with that as a very important, um, and even at a more micro level in the classroom. You know, one of the things I do, you know how, you know, in improvisational comedy, many of you hear the best way, a good technique for improvisational comedy to make it work, even though I suck at doing it, right? Um, is that, if, you know, some, somebody says something and then you have to say something. So you kind of have to do a yes and, and then you continue with this, right? Well, what I find that even in the classroom and even in research settings, like when students or people, especially from, you know, from groups maybe that you can see that they're, they're, they're feeling quiet and what have you, like, so what do you think about that? And then they'll they maybe say something and, it's, it, it, and I, what I really do, because I really believe in it, is like, right, there's some truth in that. So it's more like a, that's really interesting. And then I follow up with that idea and that thought and transform it into something else to throw back at the student, right? Miles Davis did this at jazz, by the way. His musicians, look, Miles would like have like, you know, Herbie Hancock tells a great story. He's playing with Miles Davis, right? He's like eight and playing and he, 
in the middle of an improvisation, he plays the wrong note. Literally, he is completely atonal. And in the split second, Miles Davis adjusts everything, the music, to accommodate that and make that the right note. Right? So I, I think that yeah, this technique of basically that yin and what they call it, that, I don't know what that thing is called. What's that martial arts where you kind of work with other people's energy? Um, yeah, Tai Chi, maybe. Uh, no, Tai Chi is the one that you just stand the grass and do something. Um, yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to um, amplify what the last person just said. Good. Uh, other comments? Yes, keep on. Just, I'm sorry, I couldn't see how to raise my hand, so I'll just speak. Oh. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter, just go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, the, Stephen, you just mentioned us, you were asking about what practical things are happening, and Nitin mentioned several of them, but I think one of the things that I find which is reasonably working is really that they have started a new newsletter in which one gets uh, news about underrepresented groups and it comes up all the time and that sort of serves to bind these people I mean and you know serves also gives there's a news outlet in which you know these activities actually are featured there are pictures of people uh, particularly uh, people of color and so on and so for students as well as faculty and so uh, this has, I think, has had a positive impact in the sense that people have some role of models to follow and people see that uh, there are other people like them <laughs> where these uh, various things are happening and so on. And so that is a small step, but I find that has been reasonably quite useful. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew Ziegler. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to go back to what Nitin said about the GRE, I guess. So I think whenever you have some sort of quote unquote meritocratic um, evaluation, it's always going to favor the people, you know, who are the most privileged because they have the most access to resources. And I know I, 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 I had to spend hundreds of dollars to send, to take the test and to send my score to schools. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to ask like, you know, what, you know, lateral like ability does the physics department itself have to, um, I guess remove like even because even if you have it as optional, it's still the people that submit the score are still, you know, there's still going to be a, a preference towards them. So, what like ability does the department have to sort of remove that requirement, you know, from the application? Uh, I'm glad you br brought it up again, uh, Andrew. We, today we had a, a research group conversation reflection, and one of the things that was pointed out was precisely this, namely. Um, there are lots of people in the black community who have financial difficulties and making it more and more difficult by demanding such things as GRE will only discourage them. And therefore we should seriously consider other ways of evaluating and not making it um, you know, compulsory or mandatory. Uh, that's what Nitin alluded to. Nitin, you had something more to say? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, Andrew, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, you know, one of the discussions that's been going on in the physics community amongst departments, department heads across the board is, first of all, getting rid of the GRE physics, um, which everyone has a simple option to simply drop that completely. And the reality is that, you know, we get about 500 applications for our graduate program. In those 500 applications, there are perhaps at best on a yearly basis, something like 18 students who apply from underrepresented minority groups. Um, the simple fact of, of making the GRE physics um, either optional or just dropping it altogether, there is data from places like University of Illinois, the pool of applicants increases you know, quite a bit. So for example, at Illinois, the number of women applicants doubled. Yeah? Um, and um, the number of URM applicants also, I don't know the exact number there, but probably also doubles. So, um, so these kinds of actions can play a big role towards at least increasing the pool of applicants, and then you have more choices, you know, in terms of diversifying your um, your 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 um, your department. Um, and it's it's again it's a it's a it's a matter of making those choices and figuring out how to make the right decisions in the admissions process. What you look for. And you know, I'm sure as Stefan has been at um, 
at Dartmouth and at Brown and so on, you know, the, uh, at various places, these kinds of conversations are going on. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. I want to comment. I want to actually. Can comment. I? Can I just? Yeah, go ahead, and then we'll yeah, take yeah, Michael. Uh, yes. So that's, I just want to, um, yeah, bounce on that. Um, so yeah. So first of all, we in our graduate program have gotten rid of, um, I, I think, the general GRE. Um, the research. The reason I, we've been having these conversations, and one of the things, the three things that come to mind that re the research has shown, and I think you all are more or less aware of this. First of all, the metric that that the determinant actually in terms of success in graduate school for graduate school I, I'm not, is um is actually the grades. If you you know, do you believe you know um someone's performance in a semester long quantum mechanics class where they have to solve problem sets and all that stuff? Or the, or the two quantum mechanics question they get in the physics jury, you know, um, what, that, what that coursework is measuring also is also discipline, is focus, is all that stuff. And also the letters and things like grit, you know, perseverance, um, you know, the kind of these other metrics come into play rather than like, you know, I always like to think about exams like standardized tests as playing a video game. The more you play the video game, the better you get at the video game. And if, it's, if you're testing cognitively that skill set, then that's what you're going to pr produce out of your thing. But if you're looking for a more three-dimensional nuance, um, you know, um, individual and scientists, right? I think that there, there are more in-depth metrics that we can look at and, and, and to add to all the other benefits, increasing the, the, the pool of students. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to say is that be on the watch out because the great opportunity here is that this year, I recruited, I recruited um, a student to my group who got into for the PhD program. He's an MIT undergraduate, African American. He got into Harvard. He got into Princeton. He got into Stanford. MIT undergraduate, and he's coming to Brown. And you have to ask yourself the question: Why is he doing that? And I won't answer the question, but um, my point is yeah. that we are, we, the way we engage and we take the students in a more multi-dimensional way really doesn't matter, right? And that's my story, actually. That is my story. Um, you know, I, I think like we, ha we all have our own potential. And I think that we have to pay attention to the, thing, the other things that cannot be measured directly by these exams, like perseverance, like grit, like personal makeup, all these things matter. And of course, of course, potential and, I, you know, and coursework and all these things, I think do measure that as well. Um, yeah. I just wanna add that very quickly. Uh, Michael, uh, Raklias, you want a question? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, hi, Stefan. Nice of you to join us. Gary was disappointed that you didn't invite him yourself. To <laughs> Gary, uh, Gary would steal the show if he showed up. I mean, but, <laughs> but I will buy him a drink someday and uh, smooth things over for you. Now, the reason I raised my hand is because I understood that one dimension of Andrew Ziegler's question was, what happens if you make the physics GRE score optional? And those who have the resources take it and submit the results and others don't. And now you have a, an admissions committee that reviews in homogeneous files. Some of them include the physics GRE and others don't. Did I understand this correctly, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think that's the point. Like even if you have it as an option, the people who have more resources are still going to do it to make their application exactly. as possible. Yes, exactly. So this is a topic that came up for discussion in the astronomy department. In the past six months, we've had multiple discussions of all these issues. I will offer my opinion. Some of my colleagues agree with me, but not, not all of them. In my opinion, the physics GRE should not show up in somebody's file. Making it optional creates as many problems as it solves because it un opens the door to our unconscious biases. We all have them and we all uh, will see the score. And we, even if we try to resist taking it into account, it won't be easy to ignore it. So it's better if we don't see it. We cannot resist making comparisons. And I can give you a scenario just as an example. Suppose two students from the same small college uh, submit applications. One of them includes a physics GRE score and the other doesn't. Are we confident that we will not let one person's GRE score influence how we view the other, even if we don't know it? Uh, so for all, for, this is one example, but you can all think of other scenarios. So my opinion is everybody has to play on the same level playing field. Uh, nobody should submit 
uh, sorry, there should be no option uh, for the committee to see some scores and not others. Either they see them all or they don't see any of them at all. I, yeah, I, I, I can confirm that. that. Yeah. Uh, I, who is that? No, go ahead. Uh, Kaylin again. I strongly agree with that. And I can tell you from my own experience, I took a gap year between undergrad and grad school to retake the physics GRE because I didn't want it to limit my options. And I think that that was, well, I, well, I did productive thing, other things with that year. I think it was a waste of my time and resources to, um, to be investing in that metric, especially since I knew at the time how biased it was. I felt like I still felt a lot of pressure to do that. And I did, uh, I was drawn more to universities that uh, did not require it. So I can tell you that people are looking at that and I have friends who are chose, choosing to apply to schools who that, old, um, that don't require the GRE, that don't include it. Um, I also had, a comment on um, the comparison of universities that, that Stefan was making, because uh, I went to undergrad at Brown. Uh, All right, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm also an alum myself, so. <laughs> and um, we were talking about uh, small changes we can make on a department level that could improve people's experience. And I think that uh, providing more flexibility in house and in the con and control to students over their own schedule, especially in the first couple years of the graduate program could make a really big difference. Uh, one of the things that drew me to Brown as an undergrad over other schools um, was the open curriculum, which uh, allowed me to have, as they say, be the architect of your own education. I, had, I didn't have GE requirements, I could control my schedule and coming from having that respect, get, really, I see it as giving respect to the students and trusting them to follow their interests and enrich themselves. Um, coming from that to having such a scripted schedule with a very heavy load um, with teaching on top of, um, uh, in, in the end, 10, 10 credits, at least in the first semester, uh, was jarring. And I personally, ended up modifying that uh, in consultation with Robinette to uh, spread out a little bit of the coursework, but that option was not made available to me until, um, until halfway through the semester. And if I had been given that option earlier, I think I would have chosen to delay different courses than I ended up delaying and it wouldn't have, and I could have stayed on track with the courses most relevant to my research. Um, so yeah, I, thank thank you, Colin. Yeah. Can I, um, Juan? I, I cannot raise my hand, so can I just ask, ask something? Uh, can I just time? ask uh, Juan to go ahead, and then Abai, we can come to you. Yeah. Juan Margalas uh, has been talking. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'm a postdoc at Penn State, um, and and there has been like super interesting things, but I don't feel like I can pour anything in this field, like in the committees to accept students or faculty or all that. But I, I do, what I do is a, a big engagement in scientific communication. And, and I think it's something where Penn State can learn a lot and, and should invest more. Uh, and actually, Stefan, I, I saw your tech talk on the, the Jazz of where you mentioned a teacher you had in school or high school, I can't remember, uh, that, that made a big difference. And I think that's something we, we can do. Like we can go there and and show role models like uh, people of color going there, like women, uh, LGBT people, and, and engage with the students. It's, it's not for make them to to like physics and and to come to study physics. I I, I think it goes beyond that. It has to to be to engage with them to to show that we're just normal people doing normal things. That you don't need to be genius because sometimes I, I think it's. It's good that they learn about Einstein or Marie Curie or all these big figures, but, but we're not. I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm not Einstein. Uh, and the problem is that they I've only talk about Einstein, Einstein, Einstein. You, I, I think we may have lost uh, Juan. We can't hear him anymore. Okay, let me invite Anupam and after that, Abhay. Anupam? Uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? No? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. 
So I was saying that uh, a lot of students never saw a researcher until they got to the university, right? They never met anybody. So the only role models are like very far away uh, role models that they cannot engage with. And, and I right. think that's yeah. something that we can do from Penn State. And, and just with that, I finish. I also say that you cannot do that at a zero cost. You have to put money. And that's something that I think Penn State should learn. And, and Abai knows that I, I propose a project to do that uh, in the high schools. And, and the budget they offer is like, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. You cannot do that. And I think it's really good, important just to, to cover the stages. I'm not saying it's more important than all the things that have been mentioned, but I think we, we should cover it. That's okay. Good idea. Uh, uh, Anupam, uh, are you able to hear us? And do you uh, want to go next? Yes, yeah. I am able to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, first of all, uh, I just want to say thank you for organizing this and especially thank you for inviting me to be a part of this because I'm not a part of PSU. I am a graduate student at the University of New Mexico. Uh, so firstly, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for all the things that you've shared today. Some of these things are, well, stuff that we see all the time and don't necessarily acknowledge or do anything about. But I want to... Uh, talk a little bit about some of the points that came up recently or in this conversation. It had to do with the idea of thinking about the physics GRE, for example. And I want to generalize this to the idea of, uh, in the way Stefan said, about thinking of exams in general as a video game. Well, it's true. We've all taken exams because the way the, the academic environment is set up right now, we need to take exams to do well and you know to get, for, get ahead in academia, we need exams. Uh, now, some of us have the fortune of getting access to these video games and are in a circumstance where playing video games is easy for us. Some of us are not. We, have, we may have exam anxiety. We may have physical discomfort that prevent us to take exams. Now, all of us agree that this is not good. In fact, I know many professors in my university think that your performance in exams in grad school is not at all commensurate with your ability to do research. However, in academia, we still keep doing this, right? We still focus on exams. We still focus on passing classes, which is primarily determined based on exams. And I feel that the system of exams in general, and specifically these uh, competitive exams like the physics GRE are based more on evaluating someone rather than teaching them some material. And I think we all agree that this is a bad idea. And I was wondering what can we do to change this so that we focus more on including, including people, enhancing their learning experience rather than focusing on taking exams. You know, it gives me this uh, sense of something which I heard during my first year of grad school is that if you can't live up to the difficulties of grad school, you're not worthy of being here. This was said by a professor in my university, I will not name them, but that attitude seems to be there. And I was wondering what can we do to change that? Thank you. Sure, thank, thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much for your input. Uh, Abhai, uh, we are coming up to the hour. So, yeah. you know, we I, can I just, uh, formally close, but continue the conversation with anyone who wants to uh, continue. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Uh, Abhai. I was uh, wondering to say that, well, maybe we should get, if Stefan is still around, maybe we should have him respond to any of these things. Uh, but my my quick thing was that, I mean, we had sort of heard quite a bit about, you know, GREs, admissions, exams, and so on and so forth. And I think we should, I, it, it's certainly true that many of these policies inhibit underrepresented groups uh, to be admitted. But I think there, at, at least we can take some concrete action, right? I mean, like not requiring GREs or something like that. But I think what is not happening enough is really, the follow up. I mean, in, in Stefan's case, the main point was that, yes, he was perhaps less prepared than many other kids, but, and many other students. But on the other hand, he picked up, right? I mean, he sort of was committed. He act and so the question is, I mean, I think that very often the first year students are brought, you know, with a good intention uh, that uh, we should have be diverse and so on and so forth but they are not really as prepared as some other students are. And then we leave them in a lurch. There is no support system at all. And several people in faculty have sort of said that. And I think this is, this is not just here, this is everywhere. I mean, in other words, we are, there's an enormous rush to 
know to remove some of the requirements and do things in order to open up the opportunities for people coming from underrepresented groups. But the fact that they are, they could also be not all of them, but many of them also be underprepared, and therefore we should do something for the first year to sort of help them more and have changed the system and so on and so forth. Uh, there are there is no not much being done anywhere, and, and also at Penn State, I think, for that. So, you know, this is the thing, so something that Jorge has been discussing, for example, in private groups quite a bit. Uh, this is something that needs to be done because there's no point in just admitting students. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, your thoughts, and then we will take a question, and then okay. we will formally close. I, I would like yeah. to hear so your let thoughts. Me, yeah, so my thoughts are some pragmatic things. Um, so, you know, so uh, yeah, so first of all, going back, that's a much a very long, and I'm happy to in that conversation. And I completely agree with both points, which is, you know, again, broadening our metrics, expanding our metrics, you know, when we evaluate and decide who promises, you know, looking at how promising a student, all these other factors are coming to play. Um, the second thing is um, the follow-up. Exactly, if you put in the resources behind, once a student of promise comes in, um, yeah, so, so providing the, the resources and, the, as I said, the follow-up, um, and, and that's definitely something, the fact, I mean, so with the pragmatic thing with that is <clears throat> one of the things that you might, I ran a program at Dartmouth called the EJS program for four years, and um, the results were the results, but let me say the results, actually, we, we reversed our um, retention rate from 18% to 90%. These were for minority students in STEM um, fields. I was the director of that program. Um, the program was fifth, a big. The program was roughly fifty percent um, um, gender split, and that was an important part of the success of the program. Um, the 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 third part of the success of the program was um, students were very engaged with each other in, phys, in in science small talk, so they were able to integrate their friendships with having each other to talk, right? And so I and I, I found that they were. At, they were performing at a higher rate once their once sort of like their lives were more integrated with each other along the lines of having activities that they can feel comfortable um, and not judge just talking science and doing science together. And so these are some really good practices that I'm happy to maybe talk more in the future about. But what I want to leave you with, with as a pragmatic thing is that encourage your students to join the National Society of Black Physicists because um, that is a student oriented organization. We've been around for 40 years. I was a member when I was a freshman 30 years ago. And um, what, what it provides is basically that sort of like, we're very much centered around the joy of science. So we come together every year, we give physics talks, there are posters, um, the students hang out and they talk physics and play video games, whatever they do. But the point is that it's basically, it fills in, it makes up for a lot of that, that lack and that happens in their home institutions where they are feeling isolated. And they can just be themselves and, and, and be a physics geek. So plug into the NSBP. And we have, um, you know, and I'm happy to follow up with, have our people follow up with you and plug your students in, because I think that would be a good follow up and action item, um, um, sort of like to, you know, plug in, support us. Um, and we're doing really exciting things, just like just two nights ago, Jim Simons um, personally. Um, has supported something called the Simons NSBP Scholars Program, which is like a mentoring program with an eye towards actually even recruiting PhD students and eventually postdocs and faculty um, for talented students. So they're going to be screening students for passion, talent, you know, um, and all the, all the elements. But if you don't have the, the support, the backup and the infrastructure to, to hone that talent, it should never be seen as coming from a place of lack. So if the if the if if in changing the metrics so that you don't include exams should be is perceived as we're lowering our quality and our standards, then it's not going to work. It has to always be coming from a place of yeah. Well, maybe it took me another year to um to you know to 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 do advanced general relativity because I didn't have it as an undergraduate maybe. But no one ever questioned my you know the fact that I had you know you know a natural ability or what have you, and and so it should be an honor for the university to be smart enough to actually identify, you know, to, to be able to identify such students in their screening process, right? So I think, I just want to throw like some of the three of those things at you. Um, and I am around and feel free 
this is, you know, as I said, I'm always Penn State family. Um, I think that this, I think Penn State, of, out of many institutions, right, that I've personally been engaged with as an employee, actually is poised with the leadership. You know, I saw that, I see that Dan was, Dan was there. Hi, Dan. Um, you know, poised with the, with the leadership and the will and the intelligence, actually, to actually um, move the compass, more so than many other places, okay? And I really mean that. So please, um, as you know, stay in touch. Um, and I'm here. NSBP is here to be, um, you know, just to, to, to play in the sandbox with you all. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stefan, for that concluding remarks. Uh, as I said, we will formally close because we need to let Stefan go. But I think we can continue the conversation. I see some hands up. I don't mind. But thanks very much, Stefan. And uh, we will uh, be in touch with you to follow up on uh, some of the points that you raised. I have taken some notes. Other people have. And we will, um, you know, really benefit. We, we have already benefited uh, from this conversation, but we'll be in touch here. Okay. Touch Actually, here. I just noticed that Irina is there. Hi, Irina. Hi. Yeah, sure. Hello. You can say hi to hi. Yeah. all the people. Say hi to Radu and here. Vlad for me. Vlad must be growing up, <laughs> Thank huh? you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my boy. Anybody else? Yeah. Bye, Stefan. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Hey, Murad, yeah. what's up? <laughs> Stefan, it's great to see you. Radu, Radu wrote a paper together, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Great to see you, Stefan. Okay, you too. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Uh, Miguel, I, I'm here. The, I Thanks. mean, I think there'll be some of us here. Do you want to make a quick point? What do you want uh, to say? Yeah, I guess I wanted to signal boost uh, something uh, real quick since Stefan mentioned um, a couple of things that really resonated with me, uh, especially about uh, interacting with students in a way that makes them feel heard. Uh, and this, this idea of using improv to do so. Uh, just a couple of, um, A, uh, there is uh, this faculty group at Penn State that uses uh, improv in pedagogy. Uh, they have lunches, uh, well, they used to before uh, the COVID times, uh, three times a semester where uh, faculty from all over Penn State would get together and talk about how to uh, use these improv methods uh, to help them teach. Uh, some of them uh, are actually people, uh, if you're involved in the community, you might uh, know about Happy Valley Improv. The four founding members of Happy Valley Improv also lead this, uh, this uh, faculty improv uh, group. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, I can't recommend them enough. If everybody here, and this is 102 participants right now, uh, come to those lunches, that would be a lot. But I'm sure that uh, with some communication with them, we can get something going that would uh, address, in particular, uh, how to do this in physics. It's something that I've been trying to do myself every time I teach. Uh, uh, in my classes and it can be particularly challenging I find because I think we usually all think of physics as an inherently evaluative uh, discipline and doing improv really requires you to sort of let go of that and to uh, one of the other tenets of improv is that um, the, the first thing that you should be thinking, you should be doing is you shouldn't be thinking about the next thing that you're going to say is that you should be really listening to your partner, the person that, that you are having a conversation with. Uh, alongside with that, I also want to signal boost. Um, this is something that I personally haven't taken part of. Um, but I am, I, this was made aware to me, uh, made known to me. Uh, by a friend of mine, uh, the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. And yes, for the older folk, this is the Alan Alda actor from MASH. Uh, but I believe that uh, he's also, the, his Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University uh, is also about using improv in, uh, in the same method. And the last thing that I wanted to say is I, I think I really, really, really agree with Stefan. Um, 
that it's really about building community. Uh, I think, I think the, the times in my life when I have been most productive have been the ones where I feel comfortable with the people that I, that, that I do science with, that it's okay to bounce ideas off of each other, that sometimes may be completely wrong. Um, but I think that's, a, you know, that's how you become better physicists. You parse out the bad ideas from the good. And I think you can really only do that in an environment where you feel okay being vulnerable. And I think that that is the, the point of community. Yeah, one last thing I want to say. I appreciate that. I, I first want to say hi. I just noticed I was going through. I just want to say hi to Peter Mazaros. Peter, hi, and, um, and Janindra. I, I, miss, I really miss talking physics with, with you all. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, um, I, I also want to kind of, I think I want to, you said making yourself vulnerable. I think, you know, one interesting thing is just want to leave you, with, us all with, right, is sometimes when we embrace discomfort, and um, Natin said, this, these are difficult conversations, is when we embrace that discomfort, there's opportunity right, for growth and for joy and for, and, and for movement forward. And just to give you a story, a very quick story, if there's um, time for a one minute quick story to leave you with this so that I can even reveal my own biases, right? I grew up in an environment in a kind of very, um, you know, mach machismo type of culture, right? Growing up in, 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 you know, from a Caribbean background and also with the societal, all the societal messages that the people that, you know, are, are, are good at science are, are, are men. And I remember I didn't, it wasn't even something that, that, that um, I even intellectually knew. And then I went to college. I remember going to college. I went to Haverford College undergraduate. <clears throat> and um, by, by sophomore year, I realized that we, um, half of our physics courses, um, I had to take at Bryn Mawr College, which is an all women's college. And it was only when I realized that I was um, for like five of my, whatever, 10 physics courses um, in, as a physics major, that I was one of two or three men in a, in a class of maybe 15 or 20 people, that I realized that my, 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 my biases because of the, the discomfort, not the discomfort, but the inconveniences of being actually not the smart one in the room, in the room of all women, right? I remember as a young person, as a young person being in that in experience, that it, it, it allowed me to take a really close look at my own biases, right, as a, as a male scientist, right? And, um, so I just want to kind of like, you know, want to use that as an opportunity to say, as I speak as someone now, because maybe the lamp post is on like the Black Lives Matter stuff, is that we see that all these things are also connected, right? And we all, going back to what Nitin says, we all have, we've all been conditioned, right? And it's part of our work as well to also, to sometimes embrace being that discomfort, embrace those um, and question our own biases. And it's a, I think it's a lifelong work to be done. And I'm really... Um, happy at least we're beginning this conversation. And I, I want to just leave with just saying that I'm really proud that Penn State, of all the institutions, reached out to me to have this conversation. I won't forget it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very Stephen. much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and uh, um, yeah, with that, we, I think we close today's event, but this is only the beginning. And we will continue to have this conversation and feedback and we will strive to listen to you know people who are sub thank you thank you everyone thank you Bye. thanks everyone thanks Stefan. thank you thank Stefan, you. thanks for coming Bye. have a great day you too uh most of the people have left. I'll be here until everyone leaves in case anyone wants to say anything. Okay, I'm going to stop, <laughs> stop recording now. Uh, yes, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Should I stop? Yeah, hi. <laughs> I think you probably.